So today the lecture is about multimodal alignment. Um, this is a very interesting topic because this is what, if you ask me what from all the five general uh, challenges in multimodal machine learning that we discussed early uh, in the first week, multimodal alignment like synchronization between modalities is probably one of the most multimodal uh, or multi-view of all of them. Uh, representation learning, which we discussed last week, is very important. Good representation is important. Um, but this is also something that's uh, important for many machine learning cases. But alignment is very uh, key to multimodal. And this will look at different type of alignment, implicit and explicit alignment. For explicit, we'll look at dynamic time warping and some extension. And for implicit, we'll talk about attention models as examples for that. So uh, multimodal alignment, we discussed it in the first week. This is the idea of finding a relationship and correspondence between two and more modality. But it's it, within a modality, we have elements in each of these modalities. Uh, if it was a series, a time series, there's sample, tam, time samples, maybe, and for each modalities. And the alignment is about, it's at, at the level of these elements, like trying to link these together. Um, some may not link to, uh, with other modality because they're unique to that modality. Some of them may be redundant, uh, like the same information is in both modality, or some of them could be complementary. Uh, meaning the two of them together from both modality start bringing a new meaning uh, intent on it. And the two type of alignment techniques that we'll study are explicit and implicit. The explicit, the loss function, what you're optimizing is the alignment. Your goal, the task is the alignment. Um, and so this is the for the uh, explicit, the implicit means your loss is something else. Maybe you're predicting emotion, sentiment, or something like this. And the implicit is like to solve this, you will need to uh, be able to do the alignment. So often you will do maybe some level of representation learning and then alignment, and then eventually your loss. So the, the alignment itself is will be latent. We'll discuss uh, next uh, on Thursday, also how representation learning and alignment could be done at the same time. But today we'll, we'll, we'll see them as two separate uh, cases. Um, so examples for both explicit and implicit. Um, so images and captions. Um, so you have the image, it has many objects in it uh, and you wanna be able to align it with the words of the caption or you're watching a video, a how-to video, and you want to align maybe the recipe with the segments in the video, uh, or in the case of uh, phrases, uh, like in, in the machine translation case, which is not multimodal, but it is a multi-view. So explicit alignment, the goal is to find the correspondence between modality. This is what the last function, and the example uh, for that is, uh, Sometimes you may have an audio track and then you have the transcript and you need to do what's called word alignment, aligning words, which are tokens, with the audio. Uh, you may also have two videos uh, and they're out of sync or they're what's called co-reference uh, resolution. Um, uh, co-reference resolution is, uh, is in the language, but co-referring expression is uh, also in the multimodal. So here in that case, we'll be assigning the words um, uh, with, um, uh, with, the with the language. There's different version of it. The, the co-referring expression task usually means only one object is linked with the whole sentence, um, but there's also other tasks where the goal is to align every object that are mentioned in the image. That's another uh, task um, that you can do. The implicit is probably the most popular and that's where we'll spend the most, both on Thursday and we'll also discuss it even on the lecture 7.1 when we also talk about module networks and things like this. But the implicit means that I have a task and my task itself may be something like, uh, maybe like uh, image captioning 
but as a step, intermediate step, I will intermediately, uh, as a middle step of this, uh, link uh, entities from the text with entities in the image. And that can be done through like a discrete uh, case, or it could be done more in a continuous sense, uh, semi-continuous, uh, like a, a attention model. It's, not, it's still somewhat discrete, uh, but a little bit more continuous. So machine translation, cross-modal retrieval, image captioning, visual question answering, all of these are using these uh, intermediate representation intermediate task of, uh, of linking uh, entities from the different modalities. Uh, and one of the key uh, approach, or at least uh, uh, that has been studied is the attention models. But let's start with explicit alignment because that may be the one you've never like directly work with, but I think is uh, important to know when you start looking at alignment. So let's say you have uh, multiple videos, maybe a video in 2D, maybe you have motion capture, and you have also some other uh, version of this, maybe in 3D, uh, 3D uh, of the person or just the leg, and your goal is to align them. Or maybe you have two videos. Uh, you have a video of LP uh, kicking the ball, and you have a video of someone else doing a similar action, but not exactly the same action. And the challenge here is that it may, may be not a one-to-one, -one, that every frame will be, will be matched. Like um, some frame may be matched to uh, multiple frame in the other modalities. In a very general case, some frame may not even match to any of the frames here. Um, so, but as a first step, let's suppose that every frame matches to at least one of the other frame. That's the first assumption we'll make. And so, if we have in this case, we have two unaligned uh, uh, time series. Um, and so uh, the first time series and the second time series may not have the same length. Uh, they will have different length. Uh, for now, let's say that they're represented with the same number, but that's not needed. So they could be from different, um, they could be a different dimension. But now let's suppose that it's a unimodal case and so that they are represented the same way. And so, but they have different length. And so you want to match, uh, you want sample of one uh, sequence with the samples of the other. And just for simplicity, I presented visually the same sequence. Um, so one way to formalize this problem is you could define a loss function uh, that find the set of indices to minimize the alignment difference. So the indices will be, the vector p will be the same length as x and the vector p t y will be the same length as y the y vector and there what it will be is we'll just say which index to use um, and then the goal will be with some kind of for example a Euclidean loss uh, saying that uh, at the end of the day i want this to be as small as possible let me find my parameters my uh, model parameters are those indices and so if the index is uh, a one, that means that I'm using the first sample. So here for X, it will be one, two, three, four, five, 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 six, seven. And for Y, the optimal will probably in this case, what I showed, one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so that's what PT, Y will be the optimal, at least the one I depicted there, and PTX will be. So where, P, where are these vector uh, and, uh, and why are the, where PTX are the vector the same length? So sorry, I mentioned a second ago, I said they are the same length. Um, what I meant is uh, not the length, the vectors themselves will be whatever the longest sequence will be. Um, uh, will be the longest you could be here. Uh, but the, um, when I said length is that PTX uh, could have a value from one to NX and PTY can be value from N one to NY. Uh, that's what I meant. And the one of the approach for that is dynamic time warping. And I don't know how many of you have uh, worked with dynamic time warping. The idea of dynamic time warping is to find the lowest cost path 
in a cost matrix. So starting from maybe uh, one one to n x n y is like how can I get from one point to another? And there's the optimal path I could use, but there's also uh, many different other path I could use. And so when I do uh, dynamic time warping, I want to do it in such a way. And that's, uh, 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 we'll say a weakness maybe, but also makes it more efficient, is like a monotonicity, meaning there's no going back in this, the kind of dynamic time warping. There's no gaps. And that's maybe one of the downside of the basic dynamic time warping is that there will be no gap, meaning every element will be mapped to something. Uh, and often to optimize, you'll have boundaries condition uh, and then you don't want to get too far. Often you will have a warping window um, and then do not insert or skip too much. And so you will have some of these constraints as well. To solve it, you in fact end up doing what is uh, known in optimization as dynamic programming while respecting those restrictions. Um, I will not go into the uh, detail of the optimization but you could imagine it as exploring this uh, path of all possible, uh, all possible path and dynamic programming will be an efficient way of finding the optimal uh, with the lowest cost in this. Um, so this is the uh, formulation, I will say the typical dynamic time warping formulation, which will be allowing us to find uh, these indices uh, in an efficient way. Um, but you could also kind of unwarp uh, the, um, the, this, uh, these uh, two signals and just unwarp it in such a way uh, that they have the same length. And then if you do this, then you get to that really nice situation uh, where uh, you can have a matrix. And so now it's no more the indices that will define uh, that's what would be the parameters. But the main thing you will be searching for is that matrix, that matrix that matches X and Y together. And so if you formulate this way, and that's a really nice formulation that will give us a lot more flexibility, is that you will find your X vector uh, matrix. Um, and if you remember, this may be of size like uh, D time NX and multiply by your WX and we'll put some constraint maybe to keep it uh, in a form as you see it visually. Um, if you multiply the two together, then I will get in a, the similar space that if I take my Y matrix and multiply by my WY, and so if I do this, then I will get a nice loss that I, in this case, I will often use like the, something like the Frobenius norm, although this could be a change, it's not a requirement, but a, a good representation will be. And, and now what's nice is I, what's, what's my WX and O and W, we know these a lot more. Uh, and so we can play with these because then we're in the world that we know better, WX, WY, it's a world we'll know better. And so how do we work? And so one of the problem with dynamic time warping, as I said, is maybe the complexity, but it may be sensitive and it's unimodal. So Ivan, if you do that other representation that I talk about, this uh, can be optimized, uh, maybe linear least square or something. Uh, we can optimize this, um, but uh, it's still only unimodal. And so how do I go? And what if I have U, uh, X and Y are from two different modalities? Oh, okay. So D, this, the dimension from Y and maybe not the same dimension as X and the space of Y may be different from the space of X. But what did we talk about last lecture? How did we manage to use, to do uh, coordinated representation. What was this one approach for coordinated representation that we studied? CCA, canonical correlation analysis, was this one way that if you have two modalities, 
and you want to learn a space uh, where they're the most correlated, that will allow us, so that will allow us to find that space where the two modalities the most coordinated. And then after that, hopefully we can do uh, the, the matching, the alignment. So canonical correlation analysis may be a good way. And if you remember, canonical correlation analysis, the reason it's called that way is that it's more than one correlation. We're finding many different projection, the way the, the text and image could be uh, correlated. Uh, but what makes it canonical is that these will be at the simple as possible and simple in the sense that they're orthogonal to each other, these projection. So if you take this, uh, and you take the CCA loss uh, and you put it in a matrix format, then you can also visualize it this way. I take X and I project my X into the HX in such a way uh, that the projection of V is also the most close to each other. And if, we, if you do this uh, with the same kind of constraint we talked about earlier, then we have the same correlation loss, a CCA loss as earlier. It's just earlier in earlier side, we had it slightly different here, but these are equivalent um, formulations uh, here. Why will I go to this slightly different formulation is that now I can take the CCA and the dynamic time warping and put them in one uh, formulation. And that was this great paper from uh, De, De La Torre uh, about U, which is a, is a, is a warping. U, U is about like uh, bringing uh, dynamic, is, uh, the U is about, uh, not the warping, me about the projection, projecting my X into a space that is correlated with my uh, Y. So I project Y with V, X with U, and then WX and WY are there to, cur to do the alignment. So within the same loss function, I'm able to do my projection, which is in a sense my, almost my representation learning and my alignment together. And so we're able to do that coordinated uh, representations that allow us to then do the alignment. Uh, so this is the canonical uh, time warping. Uh, and this is um, optimized by coordinate uh, gradient descent fix one set of parameters and optimize the other. Um, that's uh, the chicken and an egg kind of optimization paradigm that has been done quite often. So, uh, so when you fix uh, WX and then you want to optimize U and V, uh, if you remember to optimize U and V in the CCA, we could use some version of eigen decomposition or SVD. Um, and then if we want to optimize WX, WI, you could use then any optimization. Um, in, in this case, maybe we'll do it not at a batch level, but over all the data. So you can uh, kind of uh, uh, Gauss-Newton kind of optimization over this. So, so this is the uh, approach for canonical time warping. Um, and now I'm asking you, how can I generalize to multiple sequence all with different modalities uh, and so if you want to generalize to multiples uh, where you have uh, multiple sequences uh, and there, so I, I will say, let's say you have a video uh, and you have also maybe uh, acoustics and you want, to you want to be able to align these together, uh, th then in this case, you can just extend the same um, uh, formulation, but here, uh, the problem is canonical correlation analysis is, is, is usually working uh, only when you have uh, can, the typical canonical correlation analysis was mostly working only uh, when you have two modalities, uh, but the generalized version of it allows you to expand that. And that's what, what this paper was doing, that was really nice. Um, and so when you do these approaches, uh, uh, you, then that's nice because then you have multiple sequences and you can uh, align these together. But even if they're from different modalities, uh, you can try to align these uh, different modalities like a, 
body, um, uh, 2D, uh, are, are, are in fact, one is one hand and the other is the other hand. Um, these outcomes to, can be aligned with this. So uh, canonical time warping, uh, it's a linear transform between modality. Okay, so uh, up to now we were having X and Y and we had a linear uh, projection. Uh, and once it's linear projected, uh, and you have also the WX, WI to do the alignment. Now, if I say, how can I make it nonlinear? Probably you thought about it, the deep canonical time warping. So now uh, the way to do the, uh, like something like CCA will be to do it in a deep uh, version of that. And so, uh, so it can be seen as both a generalization of deep CCA uh, and generalized time warping together. And that's what this uh, deep canonical time warping uh, explore in that. So, so this is <laughs> a lot of things that we studied and talked about uh, last week about CCA, but now merged with this uh, point of doing alignment explicitly uh, and to optimize uh, this, uh, then you will be the same way that you optimize the uh, non-deep version where you do it uh, solve for alignment uh, with fixed uh, projection and then uh, on the other side uh, solve uh, the projection given the alignment. And there, uh, since it's a deep representation, often we'll use more of a gradient descent. So this is the, um, the first approach uh, on the uh, deep canonical time warping. Uh, there's been extension to that uh, a little bit, but this is, I will say, the one thing if I'm talking about aligning and this is the, um, this is the loss function, what, how do I align me, my two sequences, dynamic time warping is a very uh, key one that's been there for a while, but still very uh, efficient. Um, but in many cases, I don't have uh, my, it's not my loss, it's not my direct goal. I, I want it, I still want to do it, uh, at, I still want to um, uh, do, uh, improve on this. Uh, I want to be able to do alignment, but the loss may be something else, maybe about image captioning, uh, visual question answering, and so in this case, we will do the implicit alignment so it's more like a hidden. And so can we instead encourage the model to align, but this will be more of an intermediate step. And there's been quite a few approaches for that. Um, and we'll discuss around week eight uh, or seven, we started a bit in seven about graphical models uh, as one other way uh, to do alignment uh, and, uh, and to study how um, a random variable are, are, are linked together, um, uh, some like, a, uh, but for today, we will look at a, a gating mechanism. Um, if you remember LSTMs and gates, uh, we'll look at an extension of this idea of gating that has been uh, named and, and very successfully named uh, attention models. Um, attentions are a gate, like in an LSTM you have a gate. So these uh, weights that are the output of the attention will be dynamic weights. That's, that's when you say it's a gate, it's, uh, you can, should think about it. One way to think about it is like a, a dynamic weights um, of this. So, um, so the attention model is a, the intuition behind it is that uh, although let's say there's an image um, in, in the uh, displayed image, um, the eye will, uh, through the saccade and the fixation, will uh, study, will, will be focused on a subset of the image at any point in time. Uh, and, and then the rest will be, uh, will have either less or no uh, um, associated uh, sensing happening with it. Uh, in general, it's, it still has some peripheral, but it will be uh, less information gathered there than in the center. Um, so the, this uh, foveal vision 
we only see high resolution, about two degree vision, but because we move very quickly, uh, we do pick up uh, a, a more englobing vision of the image, uh, but the foreval vision is, is a very high resolution in the middle of that. Um, you could talk, uh, I could talk a lot longer about attention and the uh, human side, also the, um, uh, the offbeat uh, of, of attentions where uh, we are always in constant move. And although it looks like we're fixating one thing, it is often that you would move around and that's a very interesting aspect of human attention. Um, but for now, let's suppose we'll take this uh, interesting and very complex aspect of human vision and simplify it with uh, saying that uh, humans are focusing on a subset of, of the image uh, or subset of the information at any point in time. So, so certain words or certain uh, part of an image, uh, and this is also relevant even when you are also listening uh, listening, we are able to focus our attention on a subset maybe of the frequency band uh, or to be able to pick up a certain person talking and maybe ignoring the white noise, for example. Um, so the attention models are kind of taking this intuition uh, and, uh, and then expanding it. And the idea is to be able to have in between kind of your representation learning and your task like your, your loss, uh, to have these uh, steps of aligning uh, information together and be able to focus dynamically what information is relevant for the, my task. Um, it will also, although there is this wonderful series of paper uh, that one of them is already, uh, I believe, uh, a reading assignment and I really invite you to read or read the papers before and after that one. Um, but there is, a, att is attention uh, interpretable. Uh, that's a very interesting. Um, and, uh, and then there's attention isn't, is not interpretable and attention is not not interpretable is the paper I, I suggested for reading. So there's a really interesting uh, debate uh, in the community on this uh, interpretability. Uh, but for now, let's say that attention gives a little bit more interpretability than not having attention. So let's, let's just start with that claim. Uh, recent uh, attention models, uh, there's been quite a few, um, and I would like to kind of categorize them uh, in at least two, uh, two or three uh, categories. One is probably the most popular is like what's called soft attention. So let's say you have an image, um, you will uh, kind of wait where to look at. You're not going to say, hey, I'm only going to look at this eye of LP, but more like, let me focus more on the eye, but I'm not going to ignore the rest. Uh, it's going to be kind of a smooth one. And you probably got the intuition that having a soft attention will allow me um, to um, uh, to, to be easier for um, uh, optimization. Like, so it probably will help with the gradient, for example, uh, if it's a smooth. Another very different view of it, uh, which is probably different from many of you have thought about of attention, if you know about it, is a transform network. It's like you get the, um, the image right now, and I'm not going to try to focus instead I'm going to warp the, uh, the, the field of view to be only into the place I want uh, the information. And this is most relevant in the image world, although you could imagine extending that to language and, and, and multimodal. And the one that is the extreme, uh, and I will say it's one, two, three. One and three are differently related. One is can be the soft and the hard attention. Two is not, you should not see it as in the middle, like, like it's an intermediate or hybrid of both. The number two is really a separate way of, of looking at this, at least, at least from my perspective. But a hard attention is the idea of, of looking at a, a, a specific set of the image. And often this can be modeled through a stochastic process and, and optimized through reinforcement learning. Um, We'll discuss more about reinforcement learning in uh, week nine, but at least we'll give you an, uh, a first version uh, of this, an example of hard attention. 
but the the core of it uh, to, is the soft attention. That definitely has been the uh, the main uh, topic uh, for a while. And the extension we'll talk on Thursday is about um, uh, like self attention as an extension of that. Uh, but as a way to uh, explain attention, uh, and also because historically attention, the first attention was published uh, on machine translation. So I talk both from an histor historical perspective, but also because it, it, it's a slightly simpler to explain with the uh, machine translation. Let me explain the, um, the problem of attention with the machine translation. So machine translation, the idea here is I have a, a series of tokens like words, um, and I wanna translate from one uh, view uh, of the problem, one language, into the second view, like the second language. And so in this case, there are four words, four tokens, four samples uh, uh, in the, the first modality, in the second modality, in the generated one, uh, we'll have uh, five tokens that are generated. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not a multimodal, but a lot of similarity there to the multimodal. So just to remember how we can do uh, sequence to sequence because this is a one sequence and I want to generate a new sequence. So just a quick reminder from about uh, two or three weeks ago um, about uh, how the RNN uh, were uh, modeled. And so a quick reminder about encoder decoder framework. So uh, le chien sur la plage. Um, and so I'm going in fact the opposite way in this example. Sorry for the confusion. I'm going from French to English here. So le chien sur la plage. I go from le chien sur la plage. I could, I could have pre-trained that maybe just um, that encoder just on French data. Uh, I could have pre-trained how to encode uh, maybe by taking like one sentence and try to predict the next one. Sign so kind of uh, similar uh, to the word to vec extended to sentence level. Um, and uh, you can, or I could, uh, and at the end of the day, if I train that, I get an embedding of my language uh, for French, and then I can use that uh, to be able to start as an initial seed to generate uh, my words and, uh, and then generate the next word and, and going on until there will be, in fact, there will be one more prediction for the end uh, token. And so this is uh, the typical sequence to sequence model. But the problem here, what are the problem is that uh, the encoder hidden state capture everything in the sentence. And so the, what, what's very challenging here is you get possibly, if it's a short sentence, then the RNN hopefully can get all of the information you need. Um, but if, uh, if for some reason, um, the, um, if for some reason the, uh, it, it's a long, long sequence. And so you wanna be able to not only uh, be uh, able to encode everything, but maybe we'll use some mechanism like an attention to in fact focus on the part of the sentence at the time because encoding a full sentence can be an issue. A second issue sometime is uh, if, we, if, if you have a very long sequence, uh, it's possible that RNN may remember more certain part of the sentence, specifically like the late part of the sentence. You could solve some of it by a bidirectional RNN, but still a challenge. So if you have something like a sentence, the agreement of the European Union Economic Area was signed in August 1992. L'accord sur la zone économique européenne a été signé en nous. Uh, 1992. So if you have these and you want to translate such performance, how can we do it in a more uh, efficient and hopefully more robust way? And this is what this landmark paper uh, uh, did. Um, and so the idea, and I will do it step by step, but before ENCODE will just take the final. So usually we'll just take the uh, encoding of all the words and, and, and take this endpoint. Uh, here, 
we're not, uh, maybe we still use an RNN to encode each of them individually, but we're not just gonna use the last one. We're instead gonna say, hey, every word are important in itself. And then what I will do is I will take a seed and a seed could be as simple maybe as a start token, like a token start. And I will say, hey, uh, what are the words? Which word should I focus on as a starting point? And probably as a starting point, I will start with the first few words. And so I will, um, I will use a module, this is shown in blue here, which is gonna wait. I'm gonna say, hey, let me associate a wait with H1, a wait with H2, a wait with H3, a wait with H4 and H5. I'm gonna associate a wait, and then I'm gonna do a weighted average, very simple. And then I, that weighted average will just give me Z, Z, V, Z, the V zero, uh, not V, Z zero, sorry for that. Uh, and so what you get at the end is just a simple weighted average that says, hey, this embedding of le, this embedding of chien, I'm adding them together and those will have, let's say, very small weight. And then this will give you the uh, context. And now I will use this to predict the first word. Now I use the output of this predicted word and say, now that I predicted the word dog, what should be, which word should I focus on? And now I will have a new set of weights uh, for it. That's why they're called dynamic weights, a little bit like a gate. That's, a, that's the same idea of a gate in LSTM. Um, I'm going to gate things. So I will say, hey, dynamically weight each of them, sum them, weighted average, give you a new uh, Z, and then use that to predict the next word. And then take that one and uh, as a new seed and decide new weights and then a new Z. And you can do over and over. So before the prediction of the words uh, was dependent on the previous words and uh, of all of these words, now we'll make it in such a way uh, where the, you have it uh, not using the same encoding of the words always, but we're going to use a new encoding of the word at every time step. And so we have what the other, some people call it an attention module. I personally like the term attention gate because the same idea of as a gating, like deciding which information. You have all these words from, uh, from the source language and they could all be encoded in the same Z, but here I'm gonna decide that only a subset of them at any point in time. And dynamically, I'm gonna decide these weights these attention weight, uh, uh, often people use the letter alpha. I will use this attention weight, and this is just a weighted average. And that's what will define my atten attended uh, information, what you could call a context uh, into that. And so these attention weights are in fact just scalar from zero to one on how important. And you will usually do it in such a way that they sum to one, uh, that's often the case so that, uh, so that it, it forces it to focus. It can always decide to maybe um, uh, do, have a complete flat, but usually because of your, the way you optimize, you would put some constraint to also make it uh, more peaky if possible. Um, so how do we determine uh, the alpha? We want them to be normalized, so we'll uh, often use a soft max um, and so then these, uh, these are kind of uh, the by default, um, uh, these are the output of how important each um, word is. And these could be like a, a, as input as any softmax, these could be from plus infinity to minus infinity. They're the output of a neuron. So depending on the kind of activation function, uh, they could be minus infinity plus infinity. Maybe uh, you, you don't necessarily want them thus far. So uh, often the activation function itself will either be uh, zero to one or minus one to one. 
um, but often just zero to one. And so then uh, this is becoming just a normalization, the softmax from this. And so the, uh, the core, the gate, what will the gate do is the, the gate will be uh, looking at, um, at, the, um, uh, at the previous uh, seed uh, that you had. So the previous one, and then the latest seed, and then, um, and then just uh, find the projection to this uh, for, for each. So, so S here, um, uh, the notation, uh, just to, to, to make, S is, uh, sorry, I said seed, but what I uh, meant is not the, it's the sample, S for sample. Um, and so uh, in the case here, so every S uh, could be uh, uh, here. I use, uh, uh, so the hidden state as input uh, to this, uh, in this case. Um, and and so and then uh, so he uses the seed and the h are each of the words that you have in in your sentence so the seed will change so that's why the alpha word had two uh, indices and this is for the seed uh, because the weights are going to be different uh, the first uh, seed the second seed the third seed and these in the case of the machine translation was at, at every time I generated a different word, I got a different seed. And then I will see for every word, um, um, for every word, and that way I will get a different attention weight. Okay, um, and so basically we're running using a neural network to tell us where neural networks should be looking. So it's kind of interesting. So we have the encoder, it's a neural network, we have the decoder, it's a neural network, but then we have this other neural network, which you could almost see as a multi-layer perceptron or something, um, that, that's this gate that is gonna tell me uh, where, where should I focus my attention. And so the, and now how should I do it? I could do with a simple, like I said, the, I put it here, a multi-layer perceptron, but you could make it as complex as you want. Uh, and which input you can put there. There's a lot of vari variations on this. Uh, maybe you could use all the seeds, only the current seed. Uh, maybe you could use on all the words at the same time and instead of just one word. And so if you wanna do on all the words at the same time, maybe you will make this as an RNN instead. Uh, so uh, we can use RNN, GRU, LSTM, we can make it a bi-directional, so the attention could be bi-directional. Uh, the, all of the above. Um, uh, so the main key here is as long as it is differential, uh, as long as you can get the uh, gradient and then you can do back propagation. And so uh, once you uh, train your model at test time, you get your sentence, you go, uh, and uh, you, with the first seed, will find like the start token, for example, find which word are the most important for that first uh, seed. You will use it to make your first prediction and you go over and over. You can plot this and that's why uh, many people got excited also with attention because they were like, oh, this is, a, this is uh, definitely an improvement for interpretability because suddenly I can uh, get and see for generation of D, uh, what was the word, the token that was the most related or useful for it. Um, and what's really nice is French and English will have often a different ordering uh, with adjective and noun. So, um, so the greenhouse will be in French, will be the house green. Uh, and so there will be, a, and you can see it uh, very clearly uh, in this case. So zone economic European will be European economic area. So very different and you can see it also nicely coming out there. Uh, and on top of it, the most important is that it improve uh, classification. And so how uh, it gives a soft alignment between sentences. It's done in an iterative way and that's where um, 
the other uh, self-attention that we will talk next uh, Thursday will allow you to do it all at the same time, uh, aligning all of the component at the same time. Um, but right now we did, although we look at all words uh, for the French, for the English, we were only doing one at the time. The module, the attention module was called one at the time. But how do you do it multimodal? The word to word, that was great. We kind of, words were very nicely segmented. They are like tokens by default, so you can decide where to focus. But what if you have an image of like thousands of pixels by thousands of pixels? How can I uh, use attention and do it in a multimodal way? Um, and very quickly, when the machine translation uh, attention model came out, very quickly there was this nice landmark paper on show, attend, and tell. Um, and there, what was nice is that they were showing uh, for image captioning, as you do the captioning of a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. Um, the idea here is that every time I generate a word to see which in part of the image will be the word most helpful. And now, so some words, I will say it's, it's very ambiguous and it's like, why would it ever like look at this part of the image, very ambiguous. Um, but in the case of like some entities, women, you could say both are uh, the gender uh, uh, female, definitely there's a girl and a woman, but let's say that the algorithms uh, still see both of them is, uh, is ambiguous, but then throwing clearly is focusing more on the Frisbee. Uh, now if the really definitely the word Frisbee is even more focused and the park is, is looking around. And so, so this is nice. This is, and now you can see a little bit the, the challenge of interpreting, interpreting these attention module, uh, as you can imagine. But how can we do this with uh, current uh, uh, representation? So most uh, of the visual representation will use uh, CNN uh, representation, canon, uh, not canon, but correlation, uh, <laughs> convolution, <laughs> sorry, I, I had too many Cs recently, convolution neural network. And so the goal will be to take advantage of these representation but if you want to do the uh, typical uh, CNN uh, for, for CNN for uh, image captioning, so we'll uh, take the CNN, get a feature, and then from that feature, use it as a seed for the uh, RNN as a way to generate. Um, but uh, if we use the latest, as, uh, like if you remember, the CNN takes the image, you have a convolutions, uh, you have pooling, convolution pooling, convolution. and then at the closer to the end, we'll have a few fully connected, and then we'll have your vector often of size 3000. So one question is, can I use that vector of 3000? But the challenge there is then uh, that vector of 3000 doesn't have any more link with the image and the spatial aspect of the image because the first dimension of that 3000 doesn't mean it's any way related to the first pixel. So it's tempting to use the last one, but it's, it will not give us nice spatial information. So instead, what we'll do is roll back two layers before that and look at the last layer uh, that is a response map to the convolution. And that one, if you remember, if you have, let's say, 16 by 16, or let's say even simpler, four by four, they, have a, they are the response of convolution kernels, which are like patterns or convolution kernels, related to one part of the image. If it's four by four, then it will be closer to the top left corner. Um, and so now you have values that are not only informative about what is visually in there, what's visually, which, um, and if you remember, you will have uh, maybe four by four, but you will also have a third dimension, which is all of these convolution kernels. And so now you have a kind of, for each of these four, uh, four by four, let's say 16 locations, you have a vector of, let's say you have 50 kernels, for the last layers, 
so you have a vector of 50 uh, times 16, so like four by four, so you have a vector. And so now what you can do is take a seed, let's say the token start, and, and then learn some attention weight that will say from all these four by four, which of them are the most important given my initial seed. And then it will look at these uh, uh, four by four and give a weight. And so how many weight do you have if it's four by four? 16, you have 16 weights. And this will be, uh, these weights will be one weight for the whole vector of 50. So you will have a weighted average, which will be a vector of 50 times its weight, attention weight, another vector of 50 times its attention weight, another vector of 50. One something that's a little bit confusing is you don't get an attention for every kernels. Uh, you get an attention on one vector, one value, one scalar for the whole vector of 50, but you have 16 of them because you have every location in the image. And then you get, uh, you, uh, so Z1, what, how, what will be the dimension of Z1? 50, one by 50, okay? And then I can use that uh, to predict my first word, and I will also use that seed to predict my new attention, and then I can use this attention to predict the next Z, uh, and, and then I use that to predict the next words, uh, and, then, and, and then continue like this. And so what's really nice here um, is that suddenly I found a way to take an image and attend uh, to part of the image. Now, what are the issues but with this? Uh, what, do you think this is the perfect way of four by four? Like this, is it the perfect way to attend uh, to an image? Like uh, take an image like right now uh, that of me and like, is it really the right way? And maybe I'm lucky because the face is, is within one, but maybe my face will be cut in half. And then, so half of my face in one bin and half of the face. Now, as you know, the convolution kernel are kind of overlapping. So, um, so they're not exactly uh, cutting it that way. But still, the objects may be in one of and not the other. So for that reason, there's also other ways to look at it, which is more of an object base, where you will first maybe do object uh, detection and characterization of it, like RCNN. Um, and then you could do attention on top of that, which objects are useful for the prediction. Uh, but in general, self-attention allows uh, for latent data and alignment, so that's an implicit. It allows to get the idea uh, of what network sees uh, and can optimize uh, using backpropagation. Um, and also, uh, it was really interesting to see all the extension. Um, there was the initial paper about show and tell, which was just about uh, image captioning, and then uh, a lot of other papers after that um, which was uh, extension of attend uh, on this, a really entertaining paper's name. Um, so this is soft attention. That's one of the three that I want to discuss. Um, I want to talk about spatial, which is, I will say, the most relevant um, for uh, images, but I, I want to put this seed in your mind and maybe you think of a way to make it multimodal. So I said one of the challenge is that in the typical attention is that I will take a grid because I use the last layer uh, of a CNN uh, or the last convolution response layer of a CNN. And, um, and then I will uh, select a subset of these uh, small regions. Uh, but really maybe the object is only in a sub part of it. Uh, and so really it will end up in more than one of these elements of the grid. And so for one, I could do it an object-based uh, approach, but another uh, way to do it, that it is say, let's really focus, um, focus on a subset. And so let me find a spatial transformation 
um, and that comes from the computer vision world, spatial transformation will be, can I warp the image in such a way? And in fact, as you could call it, how can I crop? I think that's probably the term that people and every day will, will, uh, re will relate to that. In computer vision, I will say, uh, maybe a warping function, but just here, well, how can I crop um, uh, the image? So I have the original image and I want to crop it in such a way that I can do my task, which let's say is object detection, let's say if it's purely vision, or it could be image captioning. I want to do the, um, the, the, the um, uh, captioning. And so as a first step, I'm going to focus on a subset of the image and then start my captioning and then focus on another subset. And so I, for cropping, when you crop, there's four parameters that are typical, which is just a box around uh, the object. And so it becomes the offset and the width and the height of it. And then you become your, you have your image of the crop image. And so can we make, the problem with cropping is like, it, it's, it's by default is a very, um, is a very discrete thing is there is like one minute you're like you're like with the whole image and and just the second moment you're with a very small but so so it's a very uh, um, a non-convex by default maybe so what we will do is uh, is to make it a smooth process is like um, uh, 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 instead of a very sharp process is that you will find that function that that learns this um, this uh, these parameters, you will uh, learn a mapping function like from an image, find a way to uh, predict those parameters, and this is what we will call the spatial transfer network. And this for this, I need to um, uh, introduce a concept, uh, um, and this is the transformation. And there's different kind of transformation. There's the perspective uh, transformation, and that's what makes it so that my hand looks bigger and looks smaller here. That's called perspective uh, projection. Um, there is also what is displayed here is a fine transformation. Um, there's other transformation where I could rotate my screen. Um, so that's a rotation. Uh, that's a rigid transformation. Um, uh, and so, um, so the idea here is I can take points from any points in my image here and I can apply a transformation and get uh, the location of that equivalent point in this image. So instead of looking at it as a cropping, now I'm going to look at it as a warping where you have a warping function that says, give me any points here uh, at any point in the image, and I will find you uh, multiply by this matrix, which are going to become our new parameters, and I will give you a location in the target uh, after the warping. And uh, the idea here uh, is that these will become uh, parameters that I'm predicting. And so I'm going to have a gate that is going to take the input image uh, and not do the warping because I don't know how to do the warping yet, but I'm going to take an image and that image uh, as an input go to some kind of attention or like gate to create these uh, parameters and these will be used to create the image. And then I can use this and just confirm that the attention was correct or maybe I will need to warp again and, and over and over and over. Uh, and then you can repeat uh, this over and over. So this is visually what it looks like, is like you take our original image uh, and then you will take that image, run it some, through some neural network, give you those parameters that tells you, hey, this is how you should uh, warp your image. And then you get the warp image into this. And so uh, you can see that this next network can nicely be optimized and you can nicely uh, do the gradient uh, pro uh, back propagation. Uh, and so now I can learn, give me any image, I can learn how to warp it to be as efficient as possible 
for my task. And my task could be for a uh, uh, generation of uh, a language or for, in this case, object detection. Um, so the, and this doesn't need to be complex in practice. Uh, and the sampler is this uh, function, which is the warping function that warps um, this. Uh, this is a little bit in the sense warping in the same that dynamic time warping. Uh, we were warping each sequence to be, but we were warping both sequence together in the dynamic time warping. Here we're warping only one sequence, but it's not a sequence, it's a 2D image, just so that you make a link with earlier in the lecture. Um, and so um, you get uh, an input image, uh, and then you get the warping, which is the output, and then you get the, uh, so even though the image originally is very uh, warp, or you could say more warp, and then here you get, hopefully, and this is a lot clearer when the object is uh, rotated, and then at that point you can do a nice rigid uh, transformation to take that rotated object and bring it back. So this uh, example, uh, here they're plotting and their points uh, are just uh, the corners of that uh, bonding box. Uh, and so you can see how this is nicely a uh, bonding. Um, so this is differentiable uh, and it allows you to do backprop end to end, uh, but there's different kind of um, ways you can uh, do the transformation. So I talk about a fine transformation, there's perspective, you could do a spline version of that as well. So this is the second type. So it's no more like attention and gate to weight my sample, but it's an attention and gate to find that the, the output of the attention gate is not directly the weights of how important it is, but it's mostly a parameters for a warping function that will allow me to focus and then the third one is attention. And I'm gonna talk about one specific type of attention. Uh, we can discuss maybe more attention based uh, when we discuss reinforcement learning uh, in week nine. Uh, but here, the hard attention is an example here, is a limp. So the soft attention require computing and representation for the whole image. The hard attention says only a subset is gonna be uh, the main uh, is going to be my focus. Uh, and uh, hopefully, although it's debatable, uh, is, is, is to also reduce computation. And you could say it's a little bit closer to how maybe the human does, um, although it is also a little bit smooth, the human. Um, so, but the second keeps moving around. And that's the intuition that you get a little bit from it. So, so that if you're detecting a digit, the idea here is that you will look at pieces. And so, uh, so if you're looking for the word, the, 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 the six, you may be uh, looking a little bit more in this region, but still looking around just to be sure that it's not a nine or it's not a seven or an others. So you will start maybe somewhere and then you will look around just to be sure that uh, it is the digit you want. Now, they, uh, in that exact paper, they made a decision, which um, I will say is not a requirement for this uh, hard attention, but just so that you, which is the idea of uh, having the uh, very sharp feeble, like, uh, like a very sharp attention uh, with high definition and then with having lower resolution and lower resolution. So the same image is in fact, the, it, this, for the same glimpse, you get three version of it. This is really what I would call hard attention, but you, uh, in their papers, they also include both. The others a little bit broader. And you can see that this will help you because if you only see this, it may be hard where to look next, while this can give you information on where to look next. So once you, given an input image and uh, maybe an initial location, um, the giving a location, then you can get these uh, representation. Um, and that gives you a, pre pre uh, like a, 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 a response to like, uh, like where to focus. Uh, and then you can merge that with just maybe just the location itself 
and take that location and embed the location so you kind of have a, a position embedding which we'll uh, talk about in the transformer uh, you could imagine although it's it's done differently um, and here you have a, a more appearance embedding and then we'll merge both of them so you can see it as it encodes what like is that that position and where that's kind of what this is encoding but the problem is how to optimize this uh, so it's differentiable with the, with the location, uh, with the uh, glimpse parameters, but not the location um, because it keeps moving around. And so to help with this, we'll go and look at something that's a little bit close to reinforcement learning. And so in this case, uh, you have your location and you have your, uh, your image, you will uh, learn uh, to this, this part is the same module I was talking about earlier, which is embedding the image. And then from there, uh, you will uh, predict an action. An action will be move left, move right, move up, move down uh, kind of action. Once you get that, you get a new location. And then from the new location, you go ahead and you embed the, the glimpse and then from that glimpse, you're gonna get the next attention. And this, at the end, you can uh, be sure there's consistency over time by having it as an RNN. The, um, that's what the RNN here is. So you can see the similarity with our reinforcement learning uh, for people who uh, know already about it, we'll discuss it. Um, and the emission network, this part is uh, as an RNN. Uh, and the backprop is, is doable, uh, but it is a little bit more tricky in, in this case. So today, uh, and this is my last slide, uh, we talk about explicit alignment, the idea to align two or more modality. Uh, and the, here in this case, the, the loss itself is, uh, the, the task itself, the loss itself is, is, is alignment. Uh, dynamic time warping extension to canonical time warping and deep canonical time warping. Um, the uh, implicit alignment, which is the most popular one, will be, uh, it's not the loss, but looking at different attention model. Um, and so soft attention, uh, hard attention, and also a different view on where the attention is giving you the parameters of another model, which is in this case was a, a transformer model. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.